Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Jo Francis Penn. And in today's interview, I'm talking to mystery writer Toby Neal about her memoir, Freckled, about growing up wild in Hawaii. Now, I've never been to Hawaii, so it was fascinating to hear about the islands and some of the incredible places to visit there, as well as hear Toby say some of the native Hawaiian words and talk about the flora and fauna and just just wonderful. So Toby is a friend of mine and having read her fiction, it was surprising to read her memoir and discover her quite different upbringing with hippie parents living off the grid on the islands and how she overcame the challenges of her childhood to begin a new kind of life. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Toby Neal is an award-winning USA Today best-selling author of mysteries, thrillers and romance with over 30 titles. She's also a mental health therapist and today we're talking about Freckled, a memoir of growing up wild in Hawaii. Welcome to the show, Toby. Thanks so much, Joanna. I'm delighted to be talking with you today. Oh, it's it's great to have you. Now, I want to actually start with a quote from Freckles. Um, quote, the islands either accept you or spit you out, end quote, which I thought was, and there's so much in this book, but I wanted to start with this quote because I think Hawaii is one of those places that people think is all white sand beaches, palm trees, you know, uh, things with umbrellas and drinks with umbrellas in. So I wanted to start by asking you, like, what are some of the places that you love about Hawaii that are less touristy brochure. Oh, absolutely. I um, I have to start with the Nepali coast on Kauai. It is so insanely gorgeous, and there's so many wonderful ways to see it as a visitor. And it's one of these places in our world that is relatively unchanged from the time that I grew up there in the 60s and 70s. So whether you see it by helicopter or by one of the Zodiac boat tours or whether you hike that coast, it is one of the crown jewels of the planet, I truly believe, and has just this incredible energy to it. I've written about it in several of my mystery novels. And uh, one of them, Wired Dawn, uses the Nepali coast as a, a really fun location. So it's it's definitely a highly recommended spot, as is Haleakala on Maui. I have a home halfway up Haleakala, and it is an extinct volcano, 200 years since it's been active. And one of your highlights of your Hawaiian vacation would be to go up there and unlike the highly touted sunrise on Haleakala, I recommend the sunset. So it's going to be, you're going to be seeing so many incredible colors and the view from the 10,000 feet down across the island and out to the ocean is incredible. And it's much less crowded. They even have to uh, book your sunrise times online now because it's gotten so crowded up there. So I highly recommend a sunset off of Haleakala. Oh, that is a good tip. Now, I want to sort of coming back to that coast. um, And and what's so lovely talking to you is you you know all the pronunciation, because I think people Mm -hmm. just assume it's like American, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's not right. Um, So the Napa'ali, is that right? Napa'ali coast? Napali. So the, the, the great thing with Hawaiian language is that there's many vowels. There's um, mu- much more use of vowels than in English, but every single vowel is pronounced. So that's your key. Like a word like kapa'a, 
which is K-A-P-A-A, and it's one of the places that I lived on Kauai, uh, that is every single, you don't put uh, vowels together into a blurred sound. Each one is pronounced. So that's your little takeaway lesson for the day on uh, (laughs) pronunciation. No, that's great. Well, coming back to that Nepali coast. So is it all palm trees? I got the sense from your um, your memoir that the the foliage and the trees are not just, you know, palm trees and white sand. What so what Mm -hmm. what is it like? Well, the native plants and trees are, they're not as showy as people think. Uh, I love the native koa tree, which is um, an acacia descended from Australia, actually. We have a lot of uh, Australian type plants that have come to the islands floated in probably by seeds. For instance, the ironwood trees that I mention in the memoir that uh, have these little cones that always hurt your feet. We always run around barefoot in Hawaii. And uh, I love the ironwoods and they love the beach. And so many Hawaii beaches are are shaded by ironwood trees and these other hardy plants called heliotrope. Uh, there's a Hawaiian word for it. Unfortunately, I can't, I can't uh, remember it, but they're these little umbrella-shaped trees with beautiful purple flowers that love to live right on the sand. So there's many different uh, kinds of trees, animals, and things that people know about. Uh, one of my books uh, it called Shattered Palms is actually set in a wilderness area on Haleakala. There's um, a wonderful preserve called Waikamoi. That's another hike that you can take in a pristine Hawaiian wilderness pre-invasive uh, species. So one of the things we battle a lot in Hawaii is the invasion of other species that are snuffing out the native plant uh, and animal life. And there isn't a lot of native animal life, but we do have our incredible native birds. And the whole plot of that book is around uh, a poaching, you know, I write mystery thrillers. So poachers are are capturing the native Hawaiian birds and selling them in China. And of course, this has never actually happened to, <laughs> to my knowledge. But by by choosing that little um, shall I say, plot point, I was able to highlight the situation with the Hawaiian birds, which is rather desperate. They are being uh, killed by climate change. And that is because they they are fall prey to avian malaria, which is carried by mosquitoes. Mm. And as long as they stay above, you know, 5,000 to 7,000 feet in height, that's why people never see them on their vacation, because they're at the very tops of the mountains hiding from the mosquitoes. But as climate change happens and we get warmer, the mosquitoes are inching their way up. And so it's uh, it's a it's a desperate time for those little birds. And uh, mm. I care about them a lot. Mm. Oh, and I, I love the idea of, of doing that hike in that wilderness and hearing, hearing the bird song. And I kind of imagine it a bit like Jurassic Park with fern, it is. Big, big ferns. It is. <laughs> yes, it absolutely is. These incredibly beautiful trees, the Lehua trees. Um, there's a wonderful legend about the Ohia. So the tree is called Ohia, But the flower is called Lehua. And there is a legend that Pele, the fire goddess, fell in love with this handsome young man, Ohia. And she wanted him for herself. And Pele is a very vengeful and powerful goddess. And she rules the volcanoes. And she basically gets whatever guy she wants. And she wanted Ohia. But he said, no, no, I'm pledged to another. I love my Lehua my my dear you know girlfriend were were pledged to be married lehua was i mean was also was in you know they came together pele tried to separate them she turned him into a tree and then she turned herself to lava and began to burn him up mm. and lehua climbed on top of him um so that she could you know be saved from the flames and the other gods and goddesses uh were perturbed with Pele's vengefulness of this young set of lovers. And so they turned Lehua 
into the blossom that's on the ohia tree. And if you look at that, it's that beautiful red blossom with a, a, it looks like a little poof, you know, Mm. there's no like traditional petals, but the, the legend has it now that you never pluck a lehua blossom off of an ohia tree because that will cause rain, but the heavens will weep for the lovers. Oh, that's such a nice story. (laughs) Yeah. It's just one of the many, many Hawaiian legends, uh, that, uh, are out there and I like to weave them into my books as little anecdotes. And that Mm. just makes it, you feel like you get a little knowledge when you're reading. Oh yeah, I love that too. And I I want to come back to the volcanic side um, because I lived on the Pacific Rim of Fire in New Zealand and, you know, you're surrounded by volcanoes and, um, you know, you're kind of, they become part of your life. But you say you have a home halfway up an extinct volcano. So how how does that volcanic aspect impact island life? Well, it's most prevalent on the big island of Hawaii, of course. And that you saw in the news, a uh, huge uh, explosion happened last year and uh, hundreds of thousands of Um, acres of fresh lava. That island is our biggest island, and it's actually the size of a couple of states in the United States. It's so huge, people can't realize that Mm -hmm. because the rest of the islands are proportionally much smaller. Um, We also have some land on the Big Island, and we bought that about 10 years ago. And on the Big Island, you can still buy oceanfront property. However, some fresh lava might just flow right over your property (laughs) and become even more oceanfront. And uh, what's unfortunate fortunate about that is that the state of Hawaii owns any new land. And so you might lose your oceanfront. Um, So we um, have not developed our land, even though it is on the ocean, because it's in what we call zone two. So the, the safety of the island is broken up into zones, and that is extrapolated to the other islands as well. So for insurance pur- purposes, a zone two is not insurable, which means mm. there's quite a possibility that you could experience volcanic activity. I think the biggest impact for the state overall is what we call VOG. Vol- it's like volcanic fog put together, VOG, V-O-G. Mm. And that is this smoky, um, fairly toxic, um, you know, I want to say, what's the word for something coming out of the volcano? Emissions, Mm. emissions. And that um, the prevailing direction is away from the islands for the most part. It's a trade wind direction. But when the wind shifts and what we call, we get what we call Kona's. um, Kona's means it blows towards the direction of Kona. um, Then the fog comes and settles and it can be quite, difficult for people with respiratory issues. That's another reason why we haven't developed our land that we bought 10 years ago thinking we'd do our we would do our uh, retirement home there and now I'm like, well, between the fog and the possibility of an actual <laughs> <Eruption>. lava <laughs> flow, um I think that we're just going to sit on that land and maybe our kids will inherit it and maybe in 30 years things will have calmed down. So yes, life is very impacted depending on where you have set yourself up to live. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, So if people are going on holiday to Hawaii, do they make sure their hotel is like in a safe zone? <laughs> I, you know, I don't think that's actually something you need to worry about too much. But if you had asthma or something, you might want to check, you know, where, you know, where, which areas get a lot of emissions. Uh, so, We've all we have a, a diligent and government that's keeping a close eye on the safety of our visitors. And the, Hawaii is primarily a tourist mm. attraction. And so we're certainly not wanting visitors to come and have a health impact. 
you know, mm. so um, and the the lava itself is quite the tourist attraction. For years, we we had an, a uh, a steady, slow uh, lava flow on the Big Island that tourists love to see, and it was so much fun. I went with my husband as well. You hike, you can take a bike, you can rent a bike, and and bike across the lot, raw lava to see the actual flow area, or you could hike, you know, and to that area and see it. And it was on the on this certain area on the Big Island. Well, last year, that whole thing went crazy. Um, But now, just as suddenly, it sort of switched off. And so it's gone back to, okay, let's go over there and look at the trickle, you know, from a boat or on a hike. And it's it's an incredible, incredible thing to see. Um, So the good news about the Big Island volcanic activity is that it's not super explosive like Krakatoa or anything. Mm. It's more of a flow. Um, mm. That's a, that's a, that's a incredible phenomenon to witness. Wow. Yeah. And it kind of feeds into the whole, um, the, the, well, the islands are born of fire. That's, that's kind of where, yes. where it's come from. Yes. So one of the other things I guess everyone thinks about, um, uh, you know, the surfing and, and the water. And in your memoir, you talk about being part of that surf community, uh, you know, when, when you were young. So, you know, what, where are the best spots, even if you're not a hardcore surfer? Let's assume nobody listening is a hardcore surfer, but where are the places <laughs> that are sort of amazing to, um, to go into, into the ocean? I just think that um, if you're visiting and you're probably going to go to Oahu, which is we call the gathering place. Each island has a little nickname, tagline, you know. Mm. Oahu is the gathering place. And the most popular tourist spot is Waikiki. And Waikiki actually has wonderful waves. Very gentle, perfect for beginners, sand bottom, you know. Mm. If you go to the north shore of Oahu, that's where I I have a a thriller that's about the professional surf scene. uh, And it's called Riptides. And it's it's set on the north shore of Oahu, very not a good place to start, but a wonderful place to sit on the beach at like Pipeline, which is very famous beach break where the you'll see the most incredible athletes in the world compete for the triple crown of surfing in the winter. So that'll be from November to January. They hold contests there and it is totally worth seeing. On Maui, a popular attraction is what what they call Jaws or Peahi. And we have 30 foot surf there that's perfectly shaped and rideable. And you have these these incredible world class athletes. That's what they deserve to be called. um, Riding these insane building sized waves. And there's just nothing like it when you sit on the bluff above Jaws and that is my island, my, uh, well, both my islands, I call them my islands. <laughs> Kauai is my first island and Maui is my second island. But, um, but I did spend time also on Oahu and the big island. Um, but I have to say, Jaws is worth seeing. And many people hear about it by the grapevine. So you can just Google that and you can see when, according to a weather report, when it's going to be breaking. And people, um, the county finally bought the bluff that's above the surf break. And the surfers approach on jet skis and boats because there's no way to get to it from a, from the land. And these, it is truly a spectacle. The waves pound down so hard that they shake the earth and you can hear this booming sound. It just fills you with adrenaline. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had the discipline and focus required to overcome every natural bit of, you know, fear that, mm-hmm. that, that it, that is, you know, humanly embedded in us. Yeah, well, that's amazing. And it's interesting because you say they're world class, world class athletes um, now. And of course, the surf scene, it it really is like that. But when you were growing up there in the 60s and and 70s, um, surfing Mm -hmm. wasn't quite as, I guess, famous. So how has Hawaii changed since you were growing up there? I think the biggest gigantic shift that we have seen in my lifetime is the movement from an agricultural state with primarily growing sugar and pineapple to a tourist and develop development kind of place. So uh, that radical shift changed everything. Uh, Kauai 
uh, experienced a gigantic change when the pineapple and sugar left. And that was probably in the mid to late 80s and 90s. I don't, I'm fuzzy on the dates, but nothing replaced that agricultural practice except development. And real estate people came in and bought up all the land. And now you have all these houses. You have a very high divide between the wealthy owners who usually for the most part live off island and this is their vacation home from somewhere else and the people who live on the island trying to make a living and that is something i write about in my books in my fiction books over and over again the the contrast between the haves and the have nots in a place that is physically beautiful and desirable to visit and and the native people cannot afford to even own their homes there which i find tragic and wrong Mm. No, it's really interesting. And of course, you you talk there about the haves and the have nots. And you write in your memoir about traveling back and forth to California um, while you were Mm -hmm. growing up. And, um, and now I think you're actually in Mm -hmm. California, right? So how how, um, I think a lot of people who are not from America may think that California and Hawaii are are similar, because I don't know, they Mm -hmm. have beaches and stuff. (laughs) Mm-hmm. So what do you mm-hmm. see what do you see as the differences I guess between California and Hawaii and and how how do you feel like where where is your home I guess That's such a great question and that's so personal I I have always had this duality in my heart you know uh having been born in California and have my my high achieving grandparents on both sides of my family. That's what I think is one of the more interesting things about the memoir and about how I grew up was that my both sets of grandparents were super high achieving. My one grandfather was a self-made millionaire back when that meant something. (laughs) (laughs) And my other, um, my other grandfather was a pioneer in the field of marine biology one of the first people to get his uh, doctorate and a world expert on sardines, which were a primary food source in all through, you know, the, the tw- early 20th century until, of course, they're fished out of existence practically. Uh, so I had these incredibly amazing grandparents and both both of my parents were reacting to that. They and they were part of that generation of wanting to forge their own path and do their own thing. And they went to Hawaii to do that. And my dad was a surfer. My mom grew up uh, in Hawaii as the daughter of a scientist. And they both uh, embraced the hippie lifestyle hated plastic, everything organic before that was a thing. (laughs) Um, So I experienced this duality of going the hippie life in the jungle, literally living in tents and off the grid, and then going back to visit my grandparents periodically or being sort of rescued by them when we ran into financial problems or health problems, um, the grandparents would rescue us. So there's this back and forth, this duality between having nothing and living in the jungle and then going to my grandparents' country club or being, you know, having clothing purchased for me every time I went back to the mainland. We call it the mainland. (laughs) So now, so now I live in the mainland and I own a home in the mainland and I own a home in Maui. And I think what I've done is, is just really embraced that duality. Uh, The two coasts are very, very different. I live in Northern California, about an hour North of, of San Francisco. The ocean is extremely cold. It is rough. It is unfriendly. I can barely stick a toe in it. (laughs) It is for not for the faint of heart. There are surfers here. I just hats off to them. They're head to toe in rubber, you know, wetsuits and and great white sharks are a very real thing. And I like to walk along the beach and look at it. (laughs) (laughs) Whereas in Maui, I love to swim in the ocean every single day and I feel embraced by that element. So it is the same Pacific Ocean, but it is very different uh, 6,000 miles apart. Yeah. And it's so interesting. I have, 
I've traveled more in, I guess, kind of the South Pacific, um, you know, from New Zealand, Tonga and Fiji and places like that. And I, I get a similar Polynesian type culture, lovely weather, great ocean. <laughs> and I always feel like I can't work in a place like that. You know, we're both writers. Um, we write <laughs> for our living. And I'm like, oh, I could never live somewhere where the weather was nice and the ocean was just great. So do you find you, that you work better in your um, when you're in San Francisco and are you on holiday in Hawaii or is it different for you? Oh, it's different for me. Yeah, I I have to learn to I have to close myself in no matter what, you know, but um, I enjoy nature. To me, nature is absolutely essential for my well-being and my mental health. And so I live in an extremely beautiful part of Northern California, right on the Russian River in the Redwoods. So every single day I start my day with a walk in the Redwoods and I I call it forest bathing. You know, that's quite the quite the thing from Japanese culture. They actually practice this. They call it forest bathing. Wait, is and that naked? Being, is that naked forest bathing? Um, not <laughs> naked. No, it's no. <laughs> Although it makes you think of that. Um, no, no. It's just the practice of meditation in nature and experience turning off all electronic influences and experiencing trees and nature, which I believe you know, as a therapist is really critical to mental health for modern society. And in Hawaii, I do the same thing. I just go to the beach instead. Um, and I take a beach walk and I walk also in um, the forest near near my house. So I do the same routines and then I just close myself into my writing studio. So I get my, my nature bath in the morning and then I close myself in. And then at the end of the day, I do it again. And um, so for me, it's just essential to live somewhere beautiful and natural. And so I've set my life up so that I can. Mm, which is fantastic. Now, it's interesting because um, I started reading your memoir and uh, this, it's definitely got some a darker side. And then, of course, I've read some of your um, mystery series set in Hawaii, which also obviously has murder and mystery in it. But, um, you know, again, that pe- what's in people's heads and, and the reality. So, like, where do you find the inspiration for writing that darker side of Hawaii? That's a great question. And um, one of the one of the questions you sent me on email was about some of the books that I would recommend besides my own books. Mm. And as I was thinking about that, um, it, it highlighted again to me the hole in the in the reading, you know, reading bookshelf that led me to to start writing my books. Um, and that was that the whole f- that me- that was for an entertaining fast paced book that was the authentic hawaii because the books that i would recommend that you read they're very they're either sort of literary and slow paced or they're um very culturally focused and so they're just not a, a vacation read and i felt like i wanted to read about Hawaii, but the kinds of books I wanted to read for recreation. You know, I didn't Mm. want to sit down with something that was hard work on my brain. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I wanted to lay on my beach towel and read an entertaining mystery set in Hawaii, but that felt like the real Hawaii. And so I, um, but the reasons that it took me so long to write. And again, when you read my memoir, it's the first 18 years of my life. And I was always journaling and I wanted to be a writer from an early age, but I didn't actually start writing seriously until I was over 40 years old. And this was because I really wanted to have a real career that, you know, made a living. And I didn't I bought into the lies of the time that you couldn't really do that. And I also had trouble finding my voice. I was trying to write literary fiction like people from the mainland. Mm. (laughs) And it wasn't until I found a story and a character, which was Leigh Tixera. She is a native, you know, multicultural police officer who, who investigates these crimes that I write about. Uh, It wasn't until I found my niche, if you will, of this, entertaining, fun read that you're actually going to learn unique things about Hawaii that I got my flow and I began writing and I couldn't, I was unstoppable. I've, I've 
I just write four or five books a year. So my memoir is very different, though. I've been working on that on and off for 10 years. And a personal memoir is such a different kind of work. Uh, But I try to have the same feeling in my memoir, like even though there's dark things, it's an entertaining and fast paced read. Mm, no, absolutely. And now you've teased us with the other books you would recommend. So what, apart from your books, um, what, what, what else should people read? Yeah, well, some of them that I have particularly loved are a little bit older or uh, something you'll want to search for. I absolutely love Susanna Moore. Susanna Moore, M-O-O-R-E. And she writes literary Uh, stories with kind of a suspenseful theme. The Whiteness of Bones is one of her stories. They're set in plantation times on Hawaii in the time of the agricultural camps. And they have a wonderful juxtaposition of white culture, Hawaiian culture, Filipino culture. Something people don't know about Hawaii is that there isn't just white people and Hawaiian people. There are all these incredible variety of races over here that all came as a part of the sugar culture. And they all each had their own sort of ethnically based camps. And those, of course, that all that patriarchal era has passed, of course, but all the descendants are now living and it's a real melting pot of different um, races. Mm. And so Susanna Moore explores the in a beautiful, beautiful lyrical voice. It's very haunting and you'll learn things in her books, but again, slow paced. So you're going to be, you know, Alan Brennert is another one who writes authoritatively about Hawaii. His, he writes historical fiction. And I also love the voice of Kiana Davenport. Her shark dialogues is very wonderful, and she is a Native Hawaiian writer that is super powerful voice and writes these sort of, um, they're kind of this composition of legend and story mixed in with modern culture. Uh, So those are all terrific, and if you're looking for a vacation guide, I recommend the Frommer's Hawaiian Hawaii Guide. Um, Frommers is a real, you know, very reliable brand. And one of my friends, uh, Shannon Wianeki, who writes for Hawaii Magazine and, uh, it, and is a terrific writer about the culture, um, she put together the latest Frommers. And I, I think it's wonderful for as a guidebook. Mm, brilliant. Wow. The problem with this podcast is every time I ask people this, I end up with a massive reading list. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got three. I've got three for you. <laughs> yeah, well, and we've got yours as well. I mean, just tell tell True. people the first um the first book in your um your main series. Yeah, the first book in my main series is called Blood Orchids, and it's set on the big island of Hawaii. And then the next one is Torch Ginger, that's set on Kauai. The third one is Black Jasmine, that's set on Maui. Are you getting a theme here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how how many islands are there? <laughs> So there are eight there are eight major islands, but for instance, Maui is actually composed of three islands. There are two small ones off the coast that are also part of the county. Uh-huh. So yeah, there we so go. anyway, I took, took the books to all the different islands to sort of give people a smattering, a different feel, because each island really does have its own flavor. Mm, that's fantastic. Now, final question. Um, you and I met in person, which was awesome, in London last year. <laughs> And I I just wanted to ask you that kind of bigger question of why do you travel and what does travel give you? Oh, I'm a bit of a travel addict, as are you. That I remember talking about that. And I feel that travel expands our minds. It teaches us things we can not learn any other way. It's there's always an adventure, even when you're going on a prepackaged tour with every possible thing sort of figured out. There are unexpected things that can happen and insights that will happen. I find travel is, it makes me feel more alive. And I think that's the most wonderful thing about it. Uh, it and 
I like to travel in a, you met me on one of the few package tours I've ever done. Um, (laughs) That was the Orient Express. It was a wonderful, wonderful trip. And so many exciting things happened. And I went with a writer's group. But normally, um, my husband and I like to travel in our Airstream. And right now, we are working on a very long, putting together a very long six to months to a year, travel through the national parks of the United States. And I plan to write about everything and make a book, another memoir book, um, which I'm already putting together from our travels. And to me, traveling is one of the great joys of life. One of the great things that makes us um, human, sets us apart uh, from other kinds of creatures is this this desire to see new horizons and have new experiences. And that comes from within. And some people really love that and some people don't. I'm one of the people who really loves it. Oh, yeah. And I think uh, our listeners are too. <laughs> so, and, and me too. Well, I hope you'll come b- back on the show and talk about the Airstream adventure because the national parks in America are um, incredible. But uh, until then, where can people find you and your books online? Take a look at tobyneal.net or you can just Google me and all sorts of things pop up. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Toby. That was great. All righty. Aloha. (laughs) Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Happy travels until next time.